Welcome back, Matanistas, to the kebab capital of the world, Gaziantep. I haven't been able so far to bring you every local speciality here, but it's not for the lack of trying. So join me on today's vlog, where we try more local specialities from Gaziantep, that city with, in my opinion, the best food in Turkey. First of all, we're going to start off with a late night snack. And I think the name of the restaurant is Pashade and, oh, I can't pronounce that, at Lokansasi, I think that's what it is. There is one thing here that caught my eye. And yes, you've guessed it, it's those sheep's heads. And apparently they make a delicious soup from these heads. I also think it's often had for breakfast, but obviously you can see it's not breakfast time. And I'm now eating on the street, way, way past the average Turk's dinner time. Now on a Saturday night, there were actually quite a few people out and about. This is a Sunday night, but such mere peccadilloes do not stop the prime mutton. Or muttonistas, do they? And slightly different accompaniments to this dish here. Obviously the lemons are normal, the herbs are normal. The bread, it's the labash type of bread, usual yoghurt drink. But I think those might be pickled turnips. Let's have a go. right you are mutton and it does absolutely nothing for me that's not to say hey that they're unpleasant but in my opinion they're a little bit bland and also surprisingly for turkey not particularly well pickled and there we have it mutton easters sheep's head soup never tried this before again not sure whether i should squeeze lemon on or not but if the lemon's there it's there for a reason Now it looks to me as if this is a variety of Bayran, the breakfast lemon rice soup I brought you the other day. With the obvious difference, of course, that it involves the head of the sheep rather than the meat that you're used to. Mm. That is good though. Obviously the actual meat you're eating won't be of the highest quality. The meat was better in the Bayran I had the other day. But the big difference here is that the head meat has provided awesome flavour to the soup, which again is a little spicy. Okay, mutton easters, that actually was quite light and refreshing. You might find that an odd statement for what is quite a strongly flavoured soup. But it's actually very clear broth. And the citrus really is the thing that brings it to life and refreshes the inner parts, mutton easters. Anyway, this vlog will be rolled on to tomorrow. But before we get on to tomorrow, there's one more thing I want to bring you today, and it's a bit more substantial, which is why I want to do it today and not tomorrow, because we've got some serious eating to do tomorrow, folks. So, I headed off to Ahi Antipan, a really good sweet shop, very close to my hotel. As I said earlier, I wanted to eat this dessert that I'd not yet tried in Turkey, tonight rather than tomorrow because I had a lot of things I wanted to cover. However, as you'll find out a bit later in the vlog, I bit off a bit more than I could chew. Okay, mutton easters, I'm settled in at a sweet shop and I've already brought you kunefe and I've already brought you baklava. There are tons and tons of sweets that you could have here and tons of types of baklava. But the other main dessert that I've not shown you yet is catnap. So we're going to try it now. I think it's pretty substantial, which is why I want it tonight and not tomorrow, because if I have it tomorrow morning and people do have it for breakfast, in the same way some North Americans have pancakes in the morning, something sweet in the morning, I will be full and bloated. So that would basically scupper the whole day. Okay, mutton easters, the cat mare has arrived. Now, for those of you who don't know what it is, I didn't know what it was before, but I've asked and I found out. It is a type of 
pastry made out of fried bread, of all things. Again, something popular from Mongolia down to North Africa, I believe. And the Turkish version, especially the Gaziantep version, uh, of course, is liberally sprinkled with pistachios, with more pistachios inside. And the big difference between the Gaziantep style and other styles is the addition of clotted cream. I think the fruit on the side is just a nice touch to present the dish and make it a little bit more rounded. Also, the milk is apparently for drinking. So my less than comprehensive research about this dish did suggest that you'd get a big portion. And here at Ahi Antapan, you get a very big portion. So the pastry is really, really light and flaky. It's as if it's about to fall apart, to be honest. And I love that clotted cream inside. Cream and nuts, always a good combination, and especially pistachios. It's not that sweet either. When I tried the baklava and the kunefe, those were like North Korean rocket-boosted jumps in my sugar level. They were so sweet. This is all right, actually. This is okay. It's not a dish I'd have by choice, but it's actually quite tasty. I prefer this to either of the other two main groups of Turkish desserts. And I also see how this makes quite a nice breakfast dish with the milk and the fruit on the side. Anyway, I will get on with this and talk to you in a few ticks. So I did finish that off. It wasn't that heavy. The fruit was a nice complement to the dish on the side. So I think the sheep's head soup and the cat pie was about enough for the evening. I wouldn't want to have had this and then gone kebabbing. So I've had it, as I said, before we go out tomorrow. And one thing that's interesting here is that they have such a sweet tooth, the locals. It's not just here in Anatolia or Gaziantep, in the whole of Turkey. It's astonishing, especially when you think that their main dishes which are intended to be savoury don't use any sugar at all usually I, i've not encountered any so i suppose it's better that way that it, there's a clear demarcation between what's sweet and what isn't but the sweet things are ott sweet i'm bringing this to you in a vlog i won't be having any at all when i'm not vlogging in fact it might be the last one in the vlogs because i think i've covered the sweets well enough anyway Onwards and upwards, Matanistas. In a few ticks, it'll be daylight and we will go hunting for more local delicacies. Matanistas, I am not in Gaziantep anymore. I'm actually in a little town called Birchalik and it's on the banks of the Euphrates River. And I'm on my way to the city of Sanli Urfa, commonly shortened to Urfa. I was going to bring you more stuff from Gaziantep in this vlog. I was going to bring you the Zogma Mosaic Palace and a couple of cracking kebab houses. However, a little stomach upset, actually quite a big one, occurred that evening. That day was supposed to be my last day in Gaziantep, so it's kind of messed things up a bit. However, we're rolling the vlog on. We're going to have a mixed kebab here. And then, of course, when we get to Urfa, I'll be able to show you some of the culinary delights there. So the vlog has changed a little bit in its nature. But having said that, it's worked out nicely that I've been able to stop here and view one of the world's historic biblical rivers. And I remember as a school child being taught about the cradle of civilization, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Well, at some stage in this trip, I'm going to get to cross both of them. Well, I'm here with my driver, Aydin, who's a taxi driver from Gaziantep, and I agreed for him to take me to Urfa, which is like a two-hour journey. And he's taken me to a nice place to stop for lunch called Beyes Sare. Forgive my butchered pronunciation there. And we have the usual selection of dishes to start with. Salad. I think that's Sig Kofta, that is. I don't know what that is. What is? Uh, uh, it's very salata. Okay. Esme, Esme? Esme. 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 okay. And like some of the scoundrels in Istanbul, he's a very honest driver, just goes by the meter. So if any of you are in this part of the world wanting to follow the same sort of itinerary, drop me a line and I'll try and put you in touch with them. And I have to say, the salad, I mean, I'm not one to rave about salads, beautifully dressed in, I think, olive oil and that pomegranate vinegar you see in so many places in Turkey. 
And you can't have a kebab without a bit of iron, can you? Anyway, after my little stomach upset, I'm prepared to pronounce myself kebab fit again. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you one massive mixed kebab. And it's not just kebab this, because I can see, I think that looks like la machine. And it, this is pide, pide? Uh, so, borek, borek. Okay, wow, well, I've never seen a borek like that before. So, we are in for a bit of a treat here. It wasn't what I was expecting at all. I just thought it would be some grilled lamb, some grilled chicken, grilled beef in various manners. But, no mutton you've got the lot today. And another discovery more than meets the eye to this kebab button Easter's. The minced lamb kebab or the mixed sheep kebab is called kimia. Some relation maybe to kima in South Asia. But we will give it a go. It does appear to be lamb with a bit of bulgur in the preparation. In fact, old sheep meat. Delicious as well. The bulgur bulks it out and adds a bit of crunch and a bit of flavour. But the actual sheep meat is very, very strong tasting. Perfect for the prime mutton. Now, a lot of the dishes I've actually shown you before, but the borax I don't think I have properly, so. Mmm. I think some cheese and some minced meat. And, most importantly, the pastry, whilst it's not wafer thin, isn't actually that heavy and soggy as I've seen before on Borex. That is actually the perfect pastry for this type of dish. Not going to get me bloated, but seals in the flavour of the meat and the cheese beautifully. So everything else on the platter is what you'd expect really. Some lamb sheesh, some chicken wings, including the pate chan kebab with aubergine and minced meat. As always, the sumac with onions and the vicious chilies coating the plate. Obviously, I'm not going to have those just after recovering from a stomach upset, but I'm going to get stuck in and I will see you a bit later. The decor in this restaurant is absolutely beautiful. Very well appointed and for somewhere, well, maybe it's not in the middle of nowhere for Turks, but it felt like that to me. So if you're stopping by the Euphrates on your way to San Leofa or Gaziantep going the other way, this Bea Soleil restaurant is a good choice. Good day to you all again, Mutton Easters. I am fully recovered now, and I am in San Leofa. This is my first whole day here, and I rushed straight out to see one of the most famous sites here, the Cave of Abraham. Now, although Abraham was apparently born somewhere in Iraq, I'm not quite sure of the exact location, he lived in this cave for some time near San Leofa. And not surprisingly, given that he's an important prophet in all of the Abrahamic religions, of course, including Islam, it's not surprising that a mosque or and a shrine has been built here to that prophet. Now, apart from a rather stunning mosque, it has to be said, I understand from what I've read there's not that much to see in there. So whilst the cave itself, from first inspection, looks dramatic, I'm going to not go in because I know a lot of people are attending to their religious duties and I wouldn't want to do anything to interfere with it or put my foot in it. Like, for example, going in the women's entrance instead of the men's entrance. And there hasn't been anything like enough food so far on this vlog. So we're going to walk through the souk. And yes, it's a souk, more of an Arabic style market than a Turkish bazaar. And then find something because I'm hungry and I'm sure you are as well. Now you hear me mutton Easter's harping on about when it's right to eat at a street store or when it feels safe and when it isn't. And I'm going to give you a quick example here of what I think is a safe place to have something. The reason why I say this one I think would be all right, although I'm not going to have a chicken donut because I've got bigger fish to fry. Women and children eating here, high turnover. I mean, 
it's early afternoon and that skewer of chicken donner has nearly been consumed and of course in the background obvious access to clean running waters so i would say that that store is probably a safe one to eat at This is not my idea of shopping, I have to say, but it's the way it's been done here for centuries and it'll carry on going like this for centuries as well. They even buy their meat from these open air markets, which I'm not sure about at all. I like a cold refrigeration display myself, but then again, I'm not a big shopper at all. Anyway, let me very briefly show you exactly what I'm on about. Well, I think it's fair to say none of the animal goes to waste here. It's not put me off having my food though. This is the way I've seen it in many, many Middle Eastern countries, similar to some of the things I saw in Pakistan. Okay, so I sometimes get a bit carried away walking. I spent hours walking around that souk. It's fascinating when you watch people living such a different lifestyle. I've walked extensively around the city as well. And before I bring you the kebab, I just happened to see a little snack place which serves something that I have never ever tried before. It's not actually from here, it's from a place called Mersin, which is on the eastern side of the Mediterranean coast of Turkey, and it's called a tantuni. And here I am at a place called Mersin Zerba Tantuni, and it's good enough for a policeman to eat at few punters filling up the seats inside then i suspect it's good enough for the prime mutton so let's go in and give it a whirl so tantuni is julian cut beef or it might be lamb in this part of the world first the meat is boiled and then stir fried in that little sack notice i'm adding i think that must be chili powder that must be and as always, one adds generous dollops of herbs, chilies, lemon, onions, and tomatoes. And that, Mutanistas, is absolutely beautiful. He's actually soaking the bread in the meaty juices. Look at that, look at that. Wow, what an intense flavor this is gonna have. Uh, it is like poetry in motion this is fantastico okay thank you now folks this is quite a lengthy wrap quite hard to hold because it's so long that it is actually flopping over a little bit but the proof of the pudding is in the eating it looks fantastic i have to say and they are actually using chicken here they had a little bit of beef but it's mainly chicken and i've noticed most of the donor stands here have been using chicken I'm wondering what's going on. Is that because I'm going further east, it's harder to get the beef? Or is it that there are supply issues at this part of the week or this part of the month with beef? I don't know. But what I can say, even with chicken, it is a meaty sensation. That is, it's not ridiculously spicy, but it is so flavoursome. And the way he's prepared the bread, slathered it with those meat juices, is absolutely awesome. I, I can't understate what a great snack this is. Every bite is an explosion of meat juices into your mouth. Sometimes the random stops, they're the best ones.
How remiss of me, Matamiste, is not to order an iron with something as meaty as this. I'm sure this is going to go together like peaches and cream with the tantuni. And look at the way it has been served. It's served in a similar way, I remember decades ago, to the French way of serving a big bowl of hot milk with breakfast. I've forgotten what it's called now. Obviously, this is ice cold. Oh, yeah. It's like peaches and cream, it really is. Or I suppose you'd say in this part of the world, it's like kebab and yoghurt. But you know what I mean. And I'm grateful yet again that they love people coming, photographing, filming, watching them cook. They all want to know about my channel. I've got a couple of extra subscribers. A far cry from people back in the UK who are paranoid about a camera being anywhere near them, even a BBC camera on a busy shopping street. And that, Matanistas, was one hell of an experience. It's what being a wandering gastronaut is all about. No script no pre-prepared list of restaurants or street food stalls, no Instagram reviews, no Google reviews, no Facebook reviews, just finding somewhere with your nose and your eyes. Very keen to show me how their food was made and extremely hospitable. They didn't charge me at the end. What wonderful hospitality and if you're watching the video, thanks again so much. Anyway, time to hit the streets again and see what else we can find in San Leofla. I have just stopped for a coffee, an iced latte, and I made some new friends there. Can you tell me your name? This is Mustafa. Well, that snack was a bit bigger than a snack and it's reduced my appetite for the evening. So I'm going to bring you another popular snack from around here and then bring you the kebabs when I roll this vlog over yet another day onto tomorrow. Maybe one good thing about that bout of sickness is that it has reduced my appetite a bit. Okay, so you might have noticed it's actually another day. I had a little sweet snack after that tantini last night and it actually meant I wasn't hungry in the evening. Anyway, not to worry. I'm still here. It's my last day in San Leofa. So without fail today, we are going to kebab it up. So let's go because there's a particular local speciality that I can't leave here without showing you mutton easters. And in case you want to know where I'm staying, it's the Alahan Boutique Hotel. Really good price, ticks all the boxes, good comfortable room, aircon even in winter. Yes, I need that because Turks overheat their rooms and hotel rooms. Big rooms, comfortable beds, efficient English speaking staff. I understand the restaurant's quite good, but generally when I visit these places, I don't eat in hotels. There are a few exceptions, but this isn't one of them. And I might add, that it's actually very well located for the old town and most of the tourist sites and the souk and bazaar that I showed you a few seconds ago. They don't actually have lifts. Well, they do, but it doesn't serve all of the hotel. But it didn't matter because the porter just grabbed my 22, 23 kilo suitcase and lugged it up two flights of stairs. That always seems to happen here when they don't have a lift. I must admit I feel more comfortable when there's a lift but I wouldn't worry if you find yourself somewhere without one, they do help you. The souk by the way is actually literally across the road from the hotel, it's that close. Quite tempted by some of the reviews of a couple of kebab houses near the entrance to the souk, inside the souk. However, two things have persuaded me not to eat here. One is the very low stools, those are just way too low for me. They do have seating upstairs I think, but I've no idea whether it's different or not. But the main reason is because I want to take you to somewhere I featured in my short vlog series, The Daily Kebab, during the World Cup. 
which had a local kebab that I want to compare and contrast with another local kebab, the most famous kebab here, the Urfa kebab. I ate here quite late at night when I did eat here last and I wonder whether it'll be any different now. But I like the variety, I like the hygiene, I like the comfort, ticks every box. So when I was here before doing my daily kebab vlog, I ordered a kebab I haven't had before called the Hash Hash Kebab. And a viewer wrote in on my Instagram account to say, well, what's the difference between Hash Hash and Eartha? They look very similar. So I'm going to see today what the difference actually is because I've ordered both of them. If you happen to come here, by the way, there is another branch. It might be a chain all over the country for all I know, but I walked past another branch which was more of a buffet, so don't be confused between the two branches. This one's the one near the souk and the cave of Abraham. As always, the sides arrive first. I've not really had a proper vegetable mezze whilst I've been in Turkey, but I do like the little side salad and the other little vegetable dishes they give to accompany your kebab and here okay yes a salad we get that all the time but this little onion preparation which might be esme with onions i'm not sure they didn't give me this last time so i'm really keen to try it or at least i don't recall them giving me it last time maybe i'm wrong one can look back at the video and see but that's pretty good that is spicy sumac onions i think I'm going to absolutely love those with the meat, absolutely. It's amazing how many of these restaurants or kebab houses do have their sort of in-house, specially made side dishes. Okay, a lot of them are the same, they're standard like the salad or the onions with sumac, but some of the stuff like that onion dish, I've not seen before. Just like the cabbage with yoghurt I had in Gaziantep. Okay, might have bit off a bit more than I can chew here, but if I go easy on the carbs, you should be able to manage them, especially if they're tasty kebabs. This is the Hash Hash Kebab, which is locally sourced lamb, male lambs, only seasoned with salt apparently, but I can see other things in there, so probably the website I've read maybe isn't accurate or they've got their own little twist on it here at this restaurant. And here, the local favourite, the Urfa kebab. Now, these can be made with beef, lamb or a mixture, but I've noticed in general around here, these kebabs tend to be made with lamb. And judging by the Donna stalls and various other stalls I've been to only having chicken at the moment, I'm wondering whether there's a little supply problem with beef. I'm not sure. OK, let's have the Urfa first, the local speciality. I asked and was told it was lamb, which doesn't surprise me. It tastes like lamb as well. To be honest, this is a little bit more similar to your sort of, I think they call them inaccurately kofters when you go to kebab places in England, although they don't have anything like as much seasoning. It's the same sort of texture of meat. Your standard ground minced lamb kebab without too many spices. Now, the hash hash kebab, and I can see that this is thickened out with bulgur, this is. Meteor with less seasoning. I thought it might be the other way around, but the hash hash has more of a natural flavour. And they look very similar, but I can assure you the taste is different. Now, I've just got to try these with the spicy onion. An outstanding combination. I've got a lovely cup of frothy iron to wash it down with and I'm going to get on with this and I suspect they're going to be a little bit surprised when all the meat's been demolished and virtually nothing else has been. And that was the chef I met on the Daily Kebab video. Now how remiss of me before getting on with polishing it off to forget to give the old chilli test. Now, the chilies of this colour that I've seen on this trip have always been hot, but for you viewers, I'd better give it a bit of quality control. Yeah, <laughs> those are the hot ones. So, if you like the heat, those are the colour chilies you want, the sort of orange to red ones. If you don't, stick to the green ones or just stay off them completely. That was pretty good and the staff were a bit bemused by plates where the meat had gone 
the onions are done, but the bread and other accompaniments were still there. Now, I must admit, I'm getting a bit confused about Eartha and Hash Hash. They said that the Eartha one is the one with just salt, which I can believe, but the Hash Hash had tomato, chilli and... Well, I didn't see any tomato at all. Could hardly taste any chilli. Although last time I did say it was a bit spicy. And as I said, I did see it being thickened with bulgur and I could see bits of spring onion in the kebab seasoning or in the kebab itself. Now the website I read described it as the other way round. I, I like the taste of both, to be honest. And I'm convinced, as I keep saying, that the hashas kebab actually uses a slightly better cut of meat, whereas the Eartha doesn't have to be lamb, it could be lamb, beef or a mixture. Well, that's left me a little bit confused about my Eartha's and hash hash. Anyway, they were both tasty, I can taste a clear difference and I'll leave a subtitle, because what I'd read and what the patron said were actually completely the opposite, so a little more research I think is required. But I recommend you try them both if you're over here and you see them on the menu. They're not radically different, nor is the Adana, the spicier version from the Mediterranean coast. Anyway, a little rest followed by another walk around for me, and then hopefully I'll have saved the best place till last. Okay, Mutton Easters, final stop. And boy, do I hate those bikes revving up. Anyway, on to the restaurant of choice for this evening. And it is a case of sort of all roads leading to Rome, really. I spend a lot of time researching, reading reviews, asking people when I can communicate with them. And the establishment behind me, the Sempor Osak Bazi, has stood out like a sore thumb. So I'm going to go in, give it a try. Doesn't mean it's definitely going to be okay, but my nose says it is, because look, there are people even eating outside here. And quite a nice looking barbecue there for the grilled meats in which this restaurant specialises. <laughs> Thank you. Well, look at this Mutton Easter's, an old stone room. I am actually on my own in here because I think most of the Turks like to sit outside and smoke. And I'm happy to be away from the smoke, obviously. Now, the waiter did speak English, so he was able to take me through the menu. And there are some very interesting kebabs here. There's a heart kebab here and a spleen kebab here. And I wanted to try them both, but I've been a chicken, but I've gone for half a portion of spleen and half a portion of chicken, just because I am a chicken. And the side dishes have arrived in no time at all. We have salad, which we get everywhere, the herbs and the onions, but we have a onion and tomato, medium spicy salad, and we have something with yoghurt. Now he said bulgur, I think it might be chickpeas, but we will see. No, bulgur it is, bulgur it is. Very nice as well. And I ran again beautifully presented in one of these big bowls with a little handle. Another little side dish or starter, this one I actually ordered, and it's called an Ishli Kofta, which is more or less the same as a Lebanese or Syrian style kibbe. Basically, bulgur and wheat and minced meat all mixed together in a ball and deep fried in a coating of more bulgur and wheat. I quite like them in Lebanese restaurants, so no reason why I shouldn't like them here. Yeah, nice. Very, very lightly spiced. It's not plain, it's got a little bit of spice. And that's what it looks like from the inside, folks. And if you go around looking for this at a Lebanese restaurant, be careful what you order because there are lots of different types of kibbeh. Well, kibbeh is used in the name of the dishes which have got nothing to do with this. For example, I believe kibbeh naya, for example, is a raw meat dish. So I spent early November going to tons of matches, 
overdoing it on, on the booze in the UK and Spain, come away from Turkey probably with a yogurt addiction instead. And the chicken looks as if it's been very richly marinated and underneath that we have the spleen and apparently it's lamb's spleen. Not sure I've ever actually had that before so let's try that first. Okay. Well, that definitely got that distinctive taste of offal. In terms of consistency, not too dissimilar to liver. But in terms of its taste, it's a little bit closer to regular meat. So maybe something in between the meat and the offal. And it goes extremely well with those onions. Now for the chicken. Look how richly that's been marinated. Oh yeah. Not only is it cooked beautifully, not only is it marinated beautifully, but they've used thigh, which is the best piece of chicken to use for such kebabs. If you use breast, if the cooking is not absolutely spot on, you'll get something that's as dry as cardboard sometimes. Anyway, as always, I'll get on with this and I'll see you later after I've enjoyed what is going to be a very satisfying kebab. Actually, on further inspection of bites two, three, and four of the spleen, I would say it's more like kidney, actually, and I know a lot of my friends out there do like a kidney kebab. It's not quite the same, but it's kidneys with a slightly fattier, meatier flavour, so I'm sure if you love kidneys, you'd love this. I will now get on with it. Quick mid-meal chilli report, and a medium-sized chilli, but it's got that colour which in Turkey has usually meant it's spicy, and it is spicy. And it's such a tasty one as well. I'm going to take a risk despite my recent stomach problems because it goes so well with this kebab. Well, I did a pretty good job on that, and that's because it was so tasty, but I couldn't quite manage off the chilli. It was a vicious chilli, that was. When I got down to the business end, I had to surrender, unfortunately, but I made a pretty good job of that, and I definitely saved the best place till last, in my opinion. Ah, a nice cup of tea to finish off, as always. And that's where I'm going to finish off this vlog. It's been a great few days here in Urfa, or Sanli Urfa as it's been extended to of late. And you've got a bit of Gaziantep and me crossing the Euphrates. Also check out my daily kebab series which was shot during the World Cup. In fact this is being shot during the World Cup but it'll come out a lot later because I've had to prioritise the food and football chat videos. But there's a lot of interesting local food content in those videos. I'm going to have to love you and leave you now. Lots more content coming up from Turkey. But until then, keep liking, keep sharing, keep subscribing. And most of all, don't forget, you can't beat a bit of mutton.